humanities foster human community. The humanities create and interpret everything that makes life worth living. The humanities are the, the place where we turn to help us understand what we value and why we value it. are both disciplines and particular ways of understanding and interpreting and interrogating and communicating what it is to be human and the human experience. The humanities are constantly kind of breaking down barriers and suppositions, including that really dominant supposition about the centrality of the individual. It's the study of the whole human experience, right? The way we think, cross-cultural thinking, cross-cultural analysis, the whole human condition, the whole human experience. It's a scholarly community that, in, uh, that apply interpretive methods uh, to images and texts produced primarily by human beings to try to understand enduring themes about identity community, meaning. Say that there's a difference between um, using a humanistic lens, which we would teach all of our students to do in a classroom, and coming to a classroom equipped with humanistic tools to understand our world, which is what humanistic expertise brings to us. I think about the, the methodologies that the humanities represent, qualitative methodologies, although increasingly the humanities are becoming um, interested in digital and quantitative methods as well which I think is a healthy reflection of their um, increasing interdisciplinarity and engagement across the disciplines. We're teaching people to think critically and analytically, to read well and closely, to understand a kind of underlying rhetoric uh, beyond all words, and uh, to understand multi-perspectivism, to understand multiculturalism, and that kind of thing. The issue is encountering people, ideas, and thoughts, uh, events that are outside the range of one's possible experience in where, terms of where one lives. And the humanities do that. It, it has the effect of opening one up to all kinds of differences, which otherwise may unconsciously, because it's different, different values, different points of view, different color skin, whatever, is threatening. And I think the humanities, in many ways, um, cuts down the range of fear and unconscious resistance uh, to differences and inclines people more toward the differences and interaction with them. The more technologically sophisticated we are, the more deeply we need to understand one another, to teach people empathy because empathy does not come naturally, to encourage curiosity in very broad and diverse ways. And the humanities does those things. Science has grown, the humanities have to deal with that. And so uh, the humanities deal off science, just as science to some degree uh, has to pay attention to ethical issues that arise uh, uh, from healthcare issues, from all sorts of perspectives. Uh, that there is a tie between the humanities and science. Uh, I happen to be particularly troubled as people have moved in the direction of thinking uh, they're in conflict, one is better than the other. The fact of the matter is uh, each is important, each has a role. One without the other probably spells disaster.
if we decide as a nation, well, it's time to focus for a while on, on science and math, engineering, we need to do that, right? We need to do that coupling it with a well-rounded individual who, who knows how to and knows why they're doing something, who thinks about connections between what they're doing and the rest of the environment, other groups of people, etc. We're all better off for that. This is not a time to shortchange the humanities. This is a time to redouble their strength. Because if America is going to lead the world, we have to first understand the world. And that's what humanities helps us do. So let's keep humanities strong. And Congress has an essential leadership role in keeping that going. So I'm willing to shoulder that responsibility. I hope you are too. It's by pairing the humanities with engineering, science, technology, and math that you'll really find the creativity that we need to move the economy ahead and make the kinds of breakthroughs that we need uh, in society. And it's through the, the, the um, sensitivity to cultures and the communities in which technology is used that true innovation occurs and that really the broader goals of society are moved ahead. I think the other thing that we have to really focus on with the humanities is a critical link to the liberal arts education. And I think critical thinking, close analysis of text, uh, uh, careful uh, argumentation on both sides, and that curiosity, that lifelong learning curiosity that the uh, humanities really instill in each and every one of us is what really makes for great leadership and the ability to advance through one's life. It's inconceivable to me that we could argue that Vanderbilt is working its way toward being a great center of intellectual pursuit if we didn't also have a significant investment in the humanities broadly writ. The, the humanities were in a particularly flourishing state at Vanderbilt in the 1980s as a result of a number of uh, important appointments that we had been able to make in the late 70s and 80s. Two faculty members, uh, uh, Alistair McIntyre, a distinguished uh, professor of philosophy, and Enrique Pupo Walker, uh, who headed the Latin American program, uh, came to see me and, and, and broached the subject this time suggesting that some kind of humanity center. So I think this can be said to be one of those things in, that was a, an idea that bubbled up from the faculty and, and uh, when it matured it became the, the, the Humanities Center, which, which opened in 1987. We learned to prize the antiquities. That's how the, the, the home, uh, Bill Vaughn's uh, grandfather's home, got to be of interest to me. I mean, it, was, it had a, a wonderful history. I was interested in preserving the history of Vanderbilt while while it moved into what we now call the 21st century. Uh, since coming to Vanderbilt, I've had the privilege of proposing several projects, uh, re restoration of historic buildings at Vanderbilt, and this has to be my favorite so far. When I was a student at Vanderbilt, this was a residence hall. This building was a residence hall, and uh, it has served any number of purposes, and it, is, it had fallen into what one might describe as advanced decay.
long home will be as functional as it is ours. It will become the home of the center for the humanities. The center for the humanities will become vital to the mission of the college. It will enhance the growth and development of the study of the humanities of Vanderbilt by promoting teaching, research, and writing within the disciplines themselves and across disciplinary lines. It will do this by bringing humanists, social scientists, and natural scientists with kindred interests together in a stimulating and supportive environment where they can learn from each other. It was an easy decision to make to put the, to put the Humanities Center in that building. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's rather antique look. Uh, it's, 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 it's loveliness and its centrality made it a natural to put it, to, to put it there. Robert Penn Warren is one of Vanderbilt's most distinguished alumni and I think it's tremendously significant that he was distinguished across a range of different kinds of writing. I was very pleased when the Humanities Center was given the, the, this distinction to be named after a scholar and a writer and a poet who himself embodies interdisciplinarity. Having Robert Penn Warren's name attached to this center honors his legacy in a very powerful and enduring way. The extraordinary development of Warren's thinking over time can be traced in all of his creative work and makes him an excellent role model for the Center for the Humanities at Vanderbilt. The decision to name the Humanities Center after Robert Pym Warren turned out to be both felicitous and instructive. Born in Guthrie, Kentucky in 1905, Warren first came to Vanderbilt as a 16-year-old freshman. Robert Penn Warren is one of our graduates, and uh, I think he went out as a Vanderbilt graduate and had an enormous impact on America. And uh, we are very, very proud to call him uh, one of our graduates. Uh, we are proud to call him a member of our faculty. After graduating summa cum laude in 1925, he went on to become one of the most eminent American writers of the 20th century. An internationally known poet, novelist, essayist, critic, and translator, as well as the first poet laureate of the United States, Warren's publishing career spanned six decades, encompassing many of the most compelling political and social issues of the era. Warren's thinking not only changed over his time, but sort of what he thought was important to think about and how to think about it changed. And so in a lot of ways, his career enacts what the Humanities Center is hoping to accomplish in small. In addition to his extraordinary achievements as a creative writer, he twice won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry and once for Fiction, along with the Bollinger Prize, a National Medal for Literature, and the Presidential Medal for Freedom. Warren was an intellectual quester with few equals. His curious and fearless mind provides an early example of the kinds of interdisciplinary spirit that has come to characterize the study of the humanities and the practice of literary writing in more recent times. That spirit of self-criticism in the context of love is what Robert Penn Warren brought to the world of letters and what the Humanities Center brings to Vanderbilt. Despite his early involvement in two groups of specifically Southern identified white writers, the fugitive poets and the agrarians, Warren developed over time into a progressive thinker about race and a supporter of the civil rights movement. I think it opens up some insights into the struggles that Warren went through as an individual as his views on civil rights and racial justice evolved over the course of his lifetime. Looking at the way he framed questions and the way he interacted with these leading figures from the civil rights era provides scholars uh, for future generations, as well as current scholars, 
insights that could easily have been lost, except for the great efforts of Mona Frederick and her colleagues. Sometime in 2006, something came across my desk that referenced a graduate student at Penn working on a dissertation related to Warren, and in this article she mentioned something about seeing some audio tapes in the Yale Library uh, from interviews that Warren did with civil rights workers. So I immediately thought, we have to digitize these conversations. Everybody in the world needs to listen to these interviews that Robert Penn Warren conducted. The Warren Center continued to build this archive and in 2012 we were able to go live with an absolutely complete archive containing all of the materials related to Robert Penn Warren's writing of this very important book. I gave an assignment where I asked the students to pick, a, um, pick one figure from the list of interviews. So listen through the interviews, pick one figure that sounds really interesting to you, and then I built an assignment around that figure. What came out in the, in, in the assignments as the students were doing them, they were fascinated by how the people sounded. Do you see your father's role and your own role as historical phases of the same process? Uh, yes, I do. I think... Uh... Uh, my father and I have worked together uh, a great deal in the last few years trying to grapple with the same problem, and uh, he was working in the area of civil rights uh, uh, before I was born and when I was just a kid, and I grew up in the kind of atmosphere that had uh, a real civil rights concern. And I do think it's the, the, the same problem that we are grappling with. It's uh, uh, the same historical process. And if, if this is what you mean, I think so. That is, there are vast differences, of course, uh, in techniques and opportunities and climate of opinion, all of those million things that are different from one generation to the other. But you see this, I see a continuity in the process and not a, not a sharp division between roles, yours and his. Uh, yes, I see a continuity. I, I don't think there's a sharp, there are certainly minor differences, but I don't think there uh, is any sharp difference. The civil rights time, the movement came to life just through the voices of these individuals. And I thought, you know, it was the best thing I think I could have done um, in terms of an assignment. And it's just a, a great resource, which was right there, right in front of us, um, under our noses right there at the Warren Center. And I think, you know, I hope to use it in the future, and I hope more and more people use it. Of all of the accomplishments in the illustrious 25 years of the Robert Penn Warren Center for the Humanities at Vanderbilt, the intervention into the history of the civil rights movement via Warren's work, and also using digital technologies to open up new ways of understanding our history is, I think, the most remarkable contribution. I think that there is a fundamental problem the way in which universities, not just Vanderbilt, but all universities, most universities, were organized in, in that we're organized in departments, we're organized by disciplines, and yet so much of the research and writing that we admire uh, speaks across disciplinary boundaries. So uh, part of the question is where then does that work get done, where does that conversation uh, occur? Uh, on our campus and um, I think that it's very clear that over the last 25 years that that discussion has occurred um, through uh, the auspices and, uh, of the Center for the Humanities and the encouragement of the uh, Center for the Humanities. We initiated in our first full year of operation, 1988-89, a faculty fellows program. Each year, faculty members at Vanderbilt submit nominations for themes of study. 
and the executive committee selects a theme that that body deems appropriate for the campus for the coming year. The faculty fellows meet, over, meet weekly over the course of the year in the Warren Center's lovely uh, seminar room and have the opportunity to plan or design a, a group project. One year's group published a collection of essays entitled The South as an American Problem. Conferences, new classes, workshops for young PhDs, many, many exciting and unique uh, programs and projects have resulted because of the collaboration between our Vanderbilt faculty fellows and the visiting scholar. For the first two years that I was here, I had a difficult time finding connections. Um, there are extraordinary, there were and there are now extraordinary faculty throughout the humanities at Vanderbilt, but sometimes when you're a young faculty member, it's difficult to make some of those connections. The foundational understanding that undergirds the center, that is, as a place to which people come to be and work together and that that togetherness is crucial to the productive work that they're engaged in and doing it together, though you also have time and space for those moments when you need to go sit down and reflect and do some work that you can only do by yourself. So in coming to Vanderbilt, one of the great advantages for me is the Warring Center because it's the one place where folks in the humanities can come together to do this. The Warren Center is really playing a crucial role, not just for sociology, of course, but uh, in the university uh, as uh, an institution that really uh, promotes uh, scholarly community among people whose disciplines seem very distant from one another and who are only located just 20 feet from one another. That sort of interdisciplinary work that was going on there finding out what other people did, finding out how they did what they did, uh, forced me to rethink everything I was doing. It's about how you then take what you've learned from other disciplines and how it changes the way you do what you do within your own discipline. So it's, it, it, it's not that you suddenly start impersonating uh, people from other disciplines, it's that it changes the way in which you think about your own work and I, that's very productive. The book I was writing uh, changed, uh, changed drastically. I presented parts of it uh, and it went against uh, a rigorous critique but in a, a friendly collegial way. Perhaps I would have written that book but it would have been a very different book and not as good, not as good at all because when you put your ideas through that much uh, right, critical brain power and perspective, magical things happen. This is a better book. Everyone's project in there was a better project. Beginning in the academic year 1994-95, our faculty fellows program was a, included a, uh, a visiting fellow. We had achieved our fundraising goals and we now had the ability to bring to our campus a scholar from outside of Vanderbilt who had an area of expertise within the theme that we were studying for that year that we didn't necessarily already have at our own institution. Since that time, we have funded 19 visiting fellows who have come to Vanderbilt and spent the year here in residence. It's a wonderful opportunity for a scholar to come and spend a year on sabbatical at the Warren Center, finishing a project or maybe starting something new. They also are able to supplement that sabbatical period with a weekly meeting with the Vanderbilt faculty fellows who have very deep interest in their work. To sit around a table with um, the intellectual heft of senior scholars uh, and the energy and excitement of graduate students has been a really wonderful way to rehearse how this work would be received by a larger reading public. But the most important thing for me has been to really think about how interdisciplinarity works. Um, that's something we always talk about in our field, but to really see that in action around the seminar table has been so, not just inspiring, but so important in thinking about how this work is gonna come together. Yeah, so one of the things when one thinks about the experience one has as a fellow is a lot of the uh, 
effects and a lot of the good effects don't really come about immediately or aren't apparent immediately. I had the opportunity to apply for the position of the director of the Center for 21st Century Studies. And one of the reasons I immediately jumped at that opportunity was because of the fantastic year I had spent at the Warren Center. I realized what a humanities center could do. I realized what a great space it created. I was able to talk during my interviews on campus about my experience as a fellow, about what I had learned about humanity centers, and these were all things that I really probably wouldn't have known very much about if it hadn't been for my time at the Warren Center. So the Warren Center experience really has, I think, um, generated consequences in ways that are foreseen and predictable. I finished the book that I set out to write, but in ways that were unforeseen and unpredictable, like my becoming a center director myself. Initially established as a faculty development program, uh, the decision was made to expand the work of the center to include graduate students. We initially began with summer fellowships for graduate students that in some ways mirrored the work of the faculty fellows program. Graduate students from different departments across the campus received these summer fellowships, met for six or eight weeks at the Warren Center and shared chapters from their dissertation with each other. This gave these young scholars the, their first real opportunity for interdisciplinary discourse. Over the course of the academic year, the young scholars who have received this fellowship are expected to complete and defend the PhD. Part of the program was is that you had to finish the dissertation. Um, and I think having that drive to finish was another essential element. Uh, because I've been in other writing groups where you don't have that end goal and it's easy to get lost. We have been happily able to host a student from Queens now every year for the past five years. Queens University and Vanderbilt University are now international partners. I think that the public lecture series are a really excellent part of the fellowship scheme. Um, on a personal note, it was great that the Warren Centre flew over my supervisor for my talk and my other supervisor was also at Vanderbilt at the time, so to have both my supervisors there for the public lecture was fantastic and great for them to meet the people that I've been working with and to see sort of how much I'd come on in the year that I've had here. So that was really fantastic. When graduate students, especially PhD students, I was no different when I was a PhD student, student, they get to a place where they're working on their dissertation and they're, the people they actually talk to about that dissertation, that circle of people gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And yet that dissertation has to speak to someone else. And, and what was great about this forum is that they had to make their dissertation chapters speak to other people. Uh, the weekly sessions we have with the other fellows have been really beneficial for my PhD. Um, firstly, because it, it's a rare opportunity for other people to really read your work intensely, which rarely happens as a PhD student other than your supervisors. So it's really helpful to get people, especially that don't work in your field, to read and intensely comment on your work. So that's been really beneficial. And related to that, I think that having people outside of your field read your work means you have to really make sure you communicate it properly for people that maybe don't work in philosophy. And so it's been a really useful exercise in making sure that one communicates one's ideas clearly um, so they can be understood by intelligent but non-specialists working outside of your field. We also host dozens of reading groups and seminars that meet at the Warren Center more informally than either the faculty fellows group or the graduate student fellows group. I was in a women's studies class with another student and we both had an interest in disability studies. 
but we didn't know who else we could talk to about it. And she said that there was the Warren Center um, and that we could start a reading group of our own and we could bring people from across campus to talk about disability studies. And so from the beginning since I've been here, the Warren Center has been that place that I have sought uh, when I've looked for new conversation partners. Um, and it's always been an inviting place. Our seminars and reading groups range across a host of topics. Very often a fellows program will develop out of a reading group or a, or a Warren Center seminar. Those scholars involved in that will decide they want to do something more than just a monthly meeting and they often will apply to uh, have the theme of the Warren Center's Fellows Year be connected to that of their reading group. A really good example of this is the Medicine, Health, and Society program at Vanderbilt. It's now, I believe, one of the largest interdisciplinary undergraduate majors, but that program started as a reading group at the Warren Center. Then members of that group decided to put it, submit a proposal to have a year-long faculty fellows program hosted by the Warren Center and the proposal was successful, so we hosted a year-long seminar on medicine, health, and society, and now it's a very important and very dynamic program on our campus. Majoring in medicine, health, and society really gave me the opportunity to expl explore a lot of areas that I did not know I was previously interested in. It really gave me the opportunity to actually get out into the community and to really see where humanities intersects with science, technology, medicine, everything that really impacts the well-being of people in both in Nashville but all across Tennessee. The Harry C. Howard Jr. Lecture Series was established in 1994 through the endowment of Mr. and Mrs. Thomas E. Nash Jr. and Mr. and Mrs. George Renfro, all of Asheville, North Carolina. The lecture honors Harry C. Howard Jr., B.A., 1951, and allows the Warren Center to bring an outstanding scholar to Vanderbilt annually to deliver a lecture on a significant topic in the humanities. Another interdisciplinary group, funded by the Tennessee Holocaust Commission and the Zimmerman Foundation, involved university scholars and high school teachers from around the state. This very successful collaborative project, directed by Professor Helmut Smith, resulted in the publication of The Holocaust and Other Genocides in 2002. Copies of the volume were distributed free of charge to every high school public and private in the state of Tennessee. When I think of the Warren Center, I think mostly I think of a certain kind of, uh, I think of two qualities perhaps, curiosity, a certain kind of both scholarly curiosity, intellectual curiosity, but I also think of generosity and the ways in which this is a, a real meeting point, a coming together of people who are not just curious about each other's work, but generous in making their own investigations into the work of others and in sharing their work with other people. For me, the Warren Center is always about a place of connection, of going, you know, having an idea and wanting to talk about it more, and then finding people who are similarly interested and in sharing that idea with them. I think the Warren Center allows for opportunities for learning and research that might not be available at other institutions. So that really opened my eyes to, to those possibilities and in making sure that when I look at graduate school education, I make sure that I'm getting a program that is multifaceted. It's been a source for me of intellectual vitality and community from the very first days of my time at Vanderbilt. The Warren Center was extremely helpful in my early years and I was mentored by some amazing people who I otherwise probably wouldn't have met. The center has been a national leader in the kind of programming you've developed. The name of this center recalls and honors one of Vanderbilt's most creative graduates. By thus commemorating the work of Robert Penn Warren, we forecast the character of the education that we envision for this university's future. 
we wish to remind ourselves that the knowledge, discipline, and creativity born by his writing helped to shape the dream and direct the mission of the center. We trust that our best heritage, which he figures, will inform the education that we have occasion. It's not an idle name, Robert Ben Warren. It embodies a promise that we have found in our past, and we hope that his spirit haunts us.